Okay, um, I will talk a little bit of what I think, my opinion about what drives Docker and non-HPC and why it hasn't catched up in, uh, in HPC. Maybe I have, I, have, I have no slide about myself. I used to work for Bool and I used to work for STC as well before that. And now I'm working for Sony for PlayStation, the PlayStation Now network. So I'm not really HPC anymore, so I have no stake and I don't sell anything, so I can talk my mind, that's good. And uh, yeah, so my take on it is the Docker momentum, I think, and as a disclaimer, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit dramatized, but um, the Docker momentum, I think, tinkers or stems from first the IT tinkering that you can use uh, a Docker container that you download from the internet and just fool around with it and fool around with it, and it's easy to um, to create little stacks that you then reuse for your own programming needs. So you, you can download an Nginx container, put your website in it, and then and run it happily. Then you can also add memcached that you do not know how to install, but you can download the, the image and then run with it. So it's easy to create an environment in which you can tinker around with IT stacks. So this accelerates software development and, and provides a very easy uh, setup for software development and makes, makes it easier to do more, more complex stuff uh, faster. And what came after or alongside with it is uh, this continuous XYZ thing that you, um, that you can make this software development uh, as a pipeline and, and create an, a way of, of automating all the steps towards your application. So you could um, hook it up to Git and then create new containers out of Git repositories and so also make more complex stuff by just combining this in a streamlined uh, pipeline manner. And for, as a pipeline, you could use Jenkins or GoCD or whatnot. So there are various choices out there. And um, yeah, this also boosts the software development and this continuous integration um, by, a, by a fair amount. Because as Holger showed, containers have started very fast and they teared down very fast. So instead of waiting five minutes for a VM to, to spin up, uh, containers are just close to instantaneously spawned, like 200, 300 milliseconds. Or May I interrupt you for a second? Can you have a look at the screen? Sure. Are you sure this is what you want? No, that's you still. I don't know how to change it. So. Yeah, just for the video, I want this. Put you out. Okay, oh, one more sec. And but good catch, Holger. Good catch. Okay, so this uh, accelerates because, as I said, virtual machines are clunky and containers are very fast to spawn, to be spawned. And uh, as well as a consequence of this, um, this hyperscalers like I used to or I work now for, uh, they chunk up their services into various little microservices, so they are called. So you chunk up your big stacks to very small uh, components which are only doing one job, but one job good, or hope, hopefully uh, do them good, so that you have this model of little components bundled together in a, a bigger framework. And as you could have this in containers as well, which are easily scaled and easily updated, and with this continuous integration also easily tested, and to make sure that your, um, that your, your stack is, is alive and kicking, this was also a um, very good thing for, or that also provided, or Docker also provides um, a good uh, boost on, on in this regard. So it also, it boosts the data center operations ease. So you could easily spin up a lot of microservices and then you have to have a framework for sure. But um, yeah, this was also um, a boost. Big data is the same as Holger showed this uh, bioinformatics workload. I was involved if you <laughs> looked at the paper. Um, the guy wanted to create, or my friend, he wants to create a, a virtual machine around to it, and I said, no, 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 you should do Docker because it's the way you do things now. And this bioinformatics workload was based on R, various uh, libraries in R, and then some Python code, and some. And so it was a huge, complicated stack, and it was uh, hard to hard to reproduce because as you waited half a year. Uh, you had different versions of R, and some versions were not really uh, around anymore, so it was really hard to reproduce it. And as bioinformatics uh, is a very fast-moving uh, yeah. discipline, 
when you want to redo something that was submitted as a paper half a year ago, good luck with that. And with, with Docker, you could have this image hash, as also uh, Holger said, you have like this git commit hash, you have also for Docker images, and then you can state in your paper, I use this image with this hash, and then you can make sure if you have the same image with the same hash, that you re really use the same um, the same uh, image, and hence the same user land. And so you can really show that you use the same tool, and if you have the same data, you should get the same result. And this is something that boosts uh, big data and bioinformatics and this data science, uh, I think also a good a good chunk. For HPC, um, yeah, we, we that the, the boost was not so big. <laughs> I said it like this, but it, okay, it's, 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 it's stereotyped, as I said. And I was wondering why this is. And I think um, for non-HPC, it's uh, that Docker is kind of, um, um, uh, it can, as I said, it can create an environment where you can uh, develop again. So if you need Elasticsearch or if you need complex software that you want to uh, program with, you just spin it up as a container and then you can uh, program against it without the hassle of setting everything up. So you don't know, need to know how to install Elasticsearch. You don't need to know how to install any other um, part or stack that you want to use. You just download the Docker Compose file, spin up the stack, and then uh, start coding, and you are up in minutes. And the same goes for different versions of Python or different versions of any programming language or any application for that matter. It's also easy to have different versions um, in different container images and then use this uh, explicitly and do not have to have this problem as Olga also said um, that you have in most HPC environments I think you have uh, one path where all the libraries are installed and then you have different passes for different library versions and within containers as you are very specific of what you need you do not have to tinker around with all the different, um, different library versions you just put one library in inside the container and then you can use the default paths and you do not have to tinker around with environment setup. I think that's also something that's uh, very beneficial. Yeah, and uh, I think like Python's virtual env, um, Docker is, is yeah, a, a step, or uh, the next step of virtual env basically, where you do not only set up your virtual Python environment, but you can spin up any environment basically. So I think Docker can also be seen as a, as a virtual env uh, 2.0 or virtual stack or whatever you will call it, but since it's it speeds up this reproducibility and this uh, this um, creation of stacks that you need to uh, program against, it's basically virtual and 2.0. But in HPC, I think that's not really um, the case because the focus is not to um, recreate a stack but recreate an environment or recreate a system, right? So it's not easy to recreate an HPC system on your laptop because you don't have the cores, right? Whereas in, in the development world, in the software development world, uh, you don't need that much resources in, in most cases. But for, um, for the HPC environments, the focus is not the software developer, or as far as I'm concerned, the focus is not the software developer so much, but more the engineer or the scientist. So um, it's either the settings to the input, or the settings to your uh, workload that you want to run, or the input itself. So that's where you iterate on. Whereas in software developer in terms, you iterate on your different, um, on your different uh, scrum, mm -hmm. scrum sprints or your different iterations on, on your software development. So, um, and in, in HPC, <coughs> that's not the case. I mean, there may be some, some guys or some parts, the ISVs, for instance, they are also software developers because they are independent software vendors, so hence the name, but they might also use Docker in HPC environments, but it's, also, it's more the non-HPC use case of a Docker, of a software developer. So for, yeah, that's, that's my, my, my statement rather, right? That um, HPC is not about software development, it's more about the in, in infrastructure, so I think that's the reason why Docker has not um, pushed too far or, or gained momentum too much in the HPC environment. And what I think I, I, I had held this slide I have uh, I had in the Stanford uh, workshop of the HPC Advisory Council a couple of months ago, but it's doing it still valid. Um, I think that splitting up the iteration or the, the development and the uh, um, operations mm -hmm. of uh, HPC's workloads 
Um, this is something that one should consider. So if you want to run only a little input deck, for instance, where you do not need so much resources, you might even uh, be able to run it on your little laptop if it has a couple of cores. Or if you want to tinker around with, uh, with the new software that you do not know, then you can um, use the Docker containers to get to use uh, get used to the software. If you and this you can do with Docker and Docker Compose. Um, Docker Compose we didn't touch, but Docker Compose is a description of multiple containers which comprise then a stack. So you can say, uh, I have a, a web server and I have a, um, a database server, and these two uh, containers are described uh, in this compose file. And the compose file is a YAML file. I should have, uh, or could I could show it after after the slides so how to spin up a little Slurm cluster with one compose file. And do this uh, after. Um, so yeah, you have this Docker daemon and you have Docker Compose and then you can spin it up on your laptop. You can even, if you need more power, move to a bigger computer in, the, in, your, uh, in your lab, for instance, or maybe you have one machine that uh, you, can, uh, you can use to, to have uh, more and more uh, performance. But once you want to go to a distributed setup, like CSCS, uh, PySDN uh, cluster or similar, distributed uh, systems, then you got a problem. As we discussed, uh, that it's hard to have Docker containers running distributed workloads like MPI because, and I have slides after, uh, a couple of, of uh, slides after, on a couple of minutes, why this is the case. I mean, to just state it a little bit, you, you need um, most likely uh, SSH to log into the remote nodes, and if they are running inside of a Docker container, then you could install SSH daemon inside of a container, but that's rather yeah, not common, I think, that's to say the least, um, because you shouldn't run a container, or that's also not common to run a container as a system container where you have a lot of uh, services, and that you shoehorn it to the uh, a virtual machine, being a virtual machine, which is uh, what, what Holger touched on, right? So you don't want to use a Docker container as a virtual machine sub substitute. Or you could, but and maybe that's the way you start with containers. But once you get to know the concept, then I think that's not um, what is really desirable. There are a couple of uh, different approaches. Um, this uh, Rocket uh, and uh, the Run C um, in the in the latest uh, version of the Docker engine, where you do not have a daemon which forks all the different containers, but rather have um, one container run by um, as a as a process. Um, yeah, this you can use. Um, from Berkeley, we, there is a project called Singularity, which is similar to what uh, Oli mentioned, this, uh, how is it called, Docker bin, no? Bin CTR. Bin CTR, where you uh, have a, a user land a container, basically. You start a process, and then you drop what you, what, what you don't need. I will touch on this uh, in the next section of the presentation. And we will have the guy behind Singularity, hopefully, and I think it should work. Um, and as a hangout session at the end of this workshop so that he can take the questions that I can't answer. Yeah, and with, uh, with the swarm, so that's uh, the right-hand side of the, uh, the bottom line, you can run multiple containers on, on a distributed system, but we have still the same issue that you need to um, connect to a remote host via SSH if you want to run your distributed workloads. So distributed workloads are not so yet, I think. But you could also use OpenStack to run uh, Docker, the Docker engine inside of the Docker Stack environment, and then you can um, run distributed services also in your environment. So a little, uh, a little touch on on, on services or, or orchestration of services. Um, Docker rather is about service orchestration, right, and, and running microservice architectures or, or applications inside um, of these little tiny Linux containers. It's not about workloads like HPC is used to do. Um, maybe big data crunching, where you have a data store that you can, um, that you do not have a distributed application that spans across multiple, um, multiple uh, nodes, but have rather multiple applications that are crunching on themselves. I think this is uh, a thing that you could employ for, for Docker without, without much problems. And stream processing as well, so it's, it's basically a service again, right, where you have um, multiple services you need to create this big stream processing clusters like Kafka or Storm or Spark, 
and this is easily also easily deployed uh, in, a, in a Docker setup. But high performance, oh yeah, high performance big data. I mean, it's nowadays uh, the IC is not only about HPC; it's also about HP big. I think it's called, high performance big data. And uh, I think this could gain more momentum in terms of Docker. As I said, I think big data is basically more batch processing than having distributed workloads. So, and we see this already that um, most vendors uh, go for the for big data workloads and move to, to that. Biosciences, as I, as I said before, um, this fast iterating disciplines, that's really nice to, to do inside of Linux containers because you have this repeat, repeatability and the reproducibility of the uh, outcome uh, via containers and you have packaging that will last for more than half a year and uh, it's easy to uh, replicate on smaller or even bigger machines. So I think this bioscience is also something that we will see a lot more. Batch systems, yeah, um, I mean, works, workload schedulers like Slurm or, or this, they, in my opinion, could really use also a little grain of, um, of, um, of Docker or of Linux containers. When you spawn um, a Slurm or when you have a Slurm cluster and you want to spawn a, a distributed process, um, and I think I have some other slides, or maybe I have, I think I have some other slides, so I don't have to go to in, into it too much now, but, um, if you have single host Slurm jobs, like not distributed jobs, as I said, like big data or bioscience, I think it's also very easy to um, employ Docker in this. And I, I can show in a bit uh, my little Slurm setup just to give you some uh, some terminal commands. Um, but also for, for distributed workloads, um, this is still a problem and I'm not sure that Docker Inc. itself will tackle that because it's not there. Uh, their main market, and I think they consider HPC as a niche, so who can blame them? Um, yeah, I think the remote task execution is a uh, problem here. Um, yeah, simple queuing systems could do the batch <laughs> job as well, I think. You could push your little workshop uh, workload into RabbitMQ, Redis, or whatever, and then fetch the job from there and then just execute it. Uh, one Pipeline that is doing it is Nextflow from uh, Barcelona. And was it the university? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's the university, right? The University yeah, of Barcelona. It is an uh, on institute to the university. It is a uh, bio uh, yeah. uh, informatics center. Yeah, and they are basically yeah, a data driven computer and pipeline, computation and pipeline. That's what they, how they call themselves. So you could have, for instance, a genomics um, application that is comprised of different steps. And Nextflow will make sure that, yeah, that's helpful. <laughs> it's not for you, it's just to look at it. Ah, so, okay. <laughs> but it is exactly that one. So ah, here you see, yeah, it's, it's, it's oh, a no, center it's for genomics regulation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, yeah. They developed yeah. Nextflow. Yeah, exactly. And they were at the last uh, workshop we had, um, uh, yeah. Big Data yeah, and that's, Cloud. Yeah. That's why we know. I see. Yeah, service orchestration. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah? Yeah, you, you mentioned <laughs> the, uh, the Docker people don't quite uh, treat uh, HPC as their main market. So okay, can you elaborate a little bit? I mean, they... More they on your understanding, yeah. Yeah, why? as far as I understood, I mean, this disclaimer I should, sure, yeah. <laughs> I should put on, on each sentence. But um, they want to provide and this is a little, little bit pathos in it, but they want to provide um, good tools for developers and they want to, to make everyone a developer and make it easy for people to spin up stacks and, Do as I said, program against it. Yeah. And, and they have more the focus on uh, the programmer and making his work easy to um, propagate to a cloud or a, or a production workload, right? So you, you, you are in your little shed in the woods and then you program with Docker on your little application and when you finish, then you can just push it to AWS with Docker Cloud or whatnot. So you have this, this streamline of, um, or the ease of developing and then publishing what you develop with Docker because you have this packaging and you have reproducibility and um, you can reliably create a little container and then push it to, um, to, to that, that you see the light of day. And for the HPC community, that's not really, as I said, it's not really the focus is not software development. It's more iterating on the inputs and iterating on the settings of the input. And it's not uh, something that 
yeah, that can can grow exponentially, right? It's not something that you will focus on if you start your 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 yeah your little Linux container shop. I mean, Docker is now by no means little anymore, but I think the opportunity within HPC for them, and that's just me talking. I I, I don't know the numbers, but they don't see this as a big opportunity. I think. So and we don't see a fast exponential growth on the users. So that's one of the reasons they kind of feel, uh, I don't care, this yeah. one is gone. So yeah. on the enterprise side, yes. Right. So I mean, they really focus on microservices. Right. That's their big mission. Uh, right. But right. then right. other people take it up and put it into, develop it further into microservice containers. Right. So that's a, uh, yeah, I mean, the, there are many of these niches which are good for uh, yeah, and it's not not that there's no no money to um, to 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 earn. I think, and this workshop shows that there is interest in Docker, and uh, everyone would love to see um, Docker gaining more momentum. But not only I think is it not this software development model that uh, yeah. could could uh, gain momentum easily. It's also that it's very fragmented, isn't it? I mean, the different sites, and if you have to, if you have one solution, you rather have a solution which is from a different vendor, and then the vendor says, mm -hmm. I have this new thing that's cool, and then the other vendor says, oh, I have my own new thing, even though they do the same thing, but they won't share their information. I think it's, yeah, it's rather fragmented, and it's hard to have one silver bullet that fits all needs. And but I they all can use Docker underneath. Sure. The same, the same Docker. Sure, but yeah. as we see with yeah. It is portable then. With, with solutions yeah. that they they don't use Docker underneath even, so they create something that's different from Docker. Who, who does that? Shifter, for instance, oh, doesn't that, use yeah, Docker. But I mean, that's different. Shifter and Docker is very different. Yeah, yeah. sure. Uh, but yeah. that's that's the point I'm making, right? It's, it's very fragmented and have one silver bullet for everyone. I mean, you as, uh, as UberCloud, they, you, you push it to, to the cloud more, since hence the name. Um, but yeah, you have to move. And you will elaborate on this, but you know the, the, the problems or you know the issues. But uh, yeah, it's, it's hard yeah. to have one silver bullet that fixes all problems. I, I think you're too humble. That's what, what <laughs> I <I'm interested. laughs> really Maybe. I mean, <laughs> how many downloads Docker did have in the first two years? You know that number? Huh? You know that number? How many downloads of Docker uh, after their first release in 2013? They had 100 million downloads. Yeah, I downloaded it five times, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so 100 million minus five. <laughs> or divided by five, because everyone knows yeah, a little bit. Oh, I'm sure. Still divided still by five. Still yeah. still it's still an amazing number, right? Yeah. 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 So it's, it's flying. Yeah, but coming back to this yeah. orchestration thing again. So um, Holger didn't touch on it, but Docker Swarm is, as I said before, it's just an accumulation or an aggregation of multiple Docker engines to build uh, a distributed or a, a bigger uh, a bigger aggregate of Docker engines. So you could push now uh, your service or your container to this cloud, or to this cloud, I shouldn't say cloud, to this um, to the swarm. And, and then uh, it will distribute or it will be uh, scheduled by an entity, the manager entity, and it will then run on one of the engines that are in this, in this uh, swarm cluster. And if a node goes down and there are uh, services that need to be rescheduled, then Swarm will make sure that this uh, container runs on a different Docker engine, so on a different node. So you have even this uh, failure uh, handling on, on Docker Swarm. And the cool thing is that it has the same API as a normal Docker engine. So you don't have the difference, uh, and this is also fostering the, the ease of use for the developer that he does not care if he has only one Docker engine, because then he can create a uh, container with the same command like docker run and then create the container. And if you have a docker swarm, you do the same. You, you just point your docker client to a different API endpoint, but the commands are still the same. And this is something that I really like about the, the docker way that they built little building blocks that, that are um, on top, that work on top of each other and they don't break the mental model that you have when you work with docker. So even if, you, if you're on the laptop or if I have a big cluster uh, of Docker, of Docker Swarm clients, and it will still see it look the same. And uh, this is simple to grasp because it's extends and builds on the same Docker API. And for services, it's uh, pretty neat. Uh, data center orchestration. <laughs> yeah, um, there is one, for instance, Kubernetes who has looked into Kubernetes. 
Oh, quite a few. Okay. Um, yeah, which is stems from uh, Borg that was uh, built inside of, of Google. And yeah, that's uh, quite a beast, I would say. I think you just could not easily scale it down to a laptop deployment. So you have this different um, different view of if you run your Docker engine on the laptop and then you want to move to a, a more complex environment with Kubernetes, then you have this mental split. And that's what I, what I really think it's really of the uh, one of the pitfalls by uh, with Kubernetes and Mesos is saying it's a very BC installation and you cannot scale it down to your laptop's environment or at least I cannot scale it down to a laptop's environment maybe someone can but um, yeah so it's possible data center orchestration with Kubernetes and Mesos uh, I, I really dislike them because it's complex but that's my, my, mm -hmm. my take then there is also there's a there's a social and a, 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 yeah, psychological part I think as well as we uh, as we know and once you approach Docker and then you try to understand what's going on with Docker it's very hard um, to to convey the message clearly because everyone thinks it's virtual machines and everyone throws in this wish list what, it's, what it should do. So you, you say, yeah, you want to solve uh, service orchestration, for instance. Let's say you have uh, a cluster and you have services that are just auxiliary, like logging, monitoring, and all this jazz. You can put it easily in Docker because it's not a distributed workload. So it's, it's what Docker is for, like having your service workload. But I think once you, you do this, then everyone will come and, and be at your step. Only you have an opinion about just, it. Just a small comment also on this point. So basically, I mean, also this kind of model that people don't realize how containers differ from virtualization. So we had, you know, some of our like ops people from like the VMware side looking at this and they're like, you know, well, you know, it's terrible. I think, you know, we can't really take very well live backups of these containers. And it's like, well, you know, <laughs> you're not, you know, you shouldn't do that. Yeah. In that way. So, you know, this, this yeah, and what I experienced as well, I mean, and the second point, uh, if you if you ask people what they want from 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 their next orchestration or from their next system, then they describe the current state as a or the desired state as current state. So they they throw in items on the wish list that they would like to see, but they don't really have. And then you you end up with solving the complete company IT with this introduction of Docker containers. So you started with a very small um, set of of, uh, of items you want to achieve with Docker. And then, since it spans so much uh, across all different um, aspects of operations and development, you, you, you will end up with a very messy uh, wish list. And some of this change, I mean, it's uh, something you cannot do much about. So if um, you, you introduce some new technology and Docker really, um, or Linux containers in general, really change the game a little bit, um, then they will find the use case, the edge case that really breaks your model. So they would say, yeah, okay, you shouldn't run SSHD, but how do you do this execution model? So it's, it's, um, I think it's really something to come up with this silver bullet that solves all the, all the problems. And uh, yeah, and that also goes or expands to the paper trail. I mean, uh, when PowerM uh, virtual machines were introduced in the, in the operations, I think it was not much of a burden because you just have to add one new checkbox that says is it a physical or a virtual server and the rest stays the same, right? You have a MAC address, you have an IP address and it's very easy to um, have this uh, paper trail that you have in the physical world uh, complying with uh, the virtual machine world. But containers, they, they break this model because you can have multiple containers sharing different namespaces so you do not have this um, this longer living virtual machines, I mean, compared to physical machines, uh, virtual machines were only maybe a couple of days or a couple of weeks uh, long running, but containers, they might even be started for just a little particular job and then they are gone. So you start them for five minutes and then you tear them down. So you don't have, you could not have the same process around containers than you can have uh, around virtual machines. And it won't map to the paper trail you already have. Yeah, but I'm also a little bit late for time, so I should I'm speed a little bit up. Um, and but uh, one other aspect is with, with AWS uh, EC2. I think uh, the threat in operations was that the IT department just says, okay, I need, or the department wants some resource, said, okay, I have this credit card here, and I could use AWS instances. I mean, it's not that 
true for uh, for HPC yet, but maybe with Uber Cloud it is easy even. And um, that was that was <coughs> the threat. And nowadays, um, if you want to have a, a system, uh, an application that uh, you have to supply the, the installation path for, so it say I want this new application. Um, then previously it was hard because you, you someone has to install it, but nowadays with Docker you could just right. download uh, the Docker image or look at the Docker file and create your own Docker file to uh, have this new service up and running. And yeah, this dynamics changed a lot. Yeah, no one is going to tolerate complex setup procedures anymore. At least I am not. So if you or, and I think that's that's for the new uh, waves of developers and, and engineers, I think they won't tolerate long um, complex setup procedures anymore because they are used to using Docker uh, at their, uh, on their laptop and uh, convincing them of having uh, ins to install this uh, different compilers and, and so on. I think that's, that's something that will, will get harder and harder. And as Holger also said or already mentioned that work works on my laptop um, it's, it's, it's now here, I think. So now with Docker, we can create a, the same environment on our laptops, and we can create it on our on our um, on our server. And this excuse works on my laptop, but not in production. That should be uh, extinct because its uh, excuse is no longer valid. Because if it works on your laptop, then uh, there is no much difference uh, to the production environment. Hopefully, so that would be the the goal. Yeah, and unicorns and lambda. I won't touch on that because it's. Uh, out of scope, maybe for next year. Um, yeah, I should continue anyways, and I can make the second one a little bit shorter. Um, yeah, the bottom art stack. So that's what I, how I came to Docker was I wanted to spawn an HPC stack on my laptop, and I tried to use VirtualBox for this. And as it turns out, you start four virtual machines on your laptop, and then you are out of juice. So then I put it aside for, for a couple of months. And then Docker came along, I think it was end of 2014, so for me it came along, or even 13, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I tried to um, start using Docker containers for this um, stack that I wanted to create. So I wanted to create logging and monitoring and a Slurm cluster and so on. And uh, that yeah, changed the game for me because I was able to create a very simple HPC setup as a bottom-up stack where I started with the smallest pieces like uh, logging and uh, monitoring container and then build upon that. And I think, um, yeah, one can look at this distinct piece of the stack and then uh, iterate and use this and do not have to spin up a complete cluster nowadays and um, work on it. Because with containers you can easily not mock but simulate your, your parts and um, go ahead with that. Yeah, and as said before, possible in HPC, since uh, the HPC stacks are a little bit bigger and you need a lot of resources, you need InfiniBand that you do not have on your laptop anyways, um, yeah, this is uh, harder to get to. Quick note on Docker 1.12, um, Olga already mentioned it, now uh, the swarm part is included in the Docker engine, so you do not need to uh, spin up your Docker swarm as a couple of containers, it's just uh, all incorporated in the Docker engine now. And uh, you also don't need an external key value store, which, which you needed before 1.12. Um, another thing is that services is now a first class citizen, but this is, uh, yeah, this is also the non HPC part. So um, you have this new command Docker services where you can say, I have this stack of my web server and my database server, and then you can push this to the Docker Swarm cluster and scale it down, scale it up, make rolling updates, make canary rack deployments and so on. And this is very nice for us cloud guys, not so much for you guys, that's sorry. Um, and there's also built-in but swappable TLS support, so all the traffic around uh, among the, the uh, engines is encrypted. Um, and there is a CA within the manager node, but you can also swap it out and use your own CAs. And it's quite nice. And it's also service uh, load balancers. Uh, the, the services load balance within the cluster and so on. It's very uh, seems to be very nice. But as Holger said, it's like two days out now. I haven't played with it. Cannot say much about it, how it works. But it looks nice at least. But I think you guys uh, don't stream loud enough because feature-wise, it's only targeted at us cl cloud guys, right? But just overrate, uh, accelerating a bit. Um, all the features I think for HPC that's um, not really. Um, yeah, not really the sweet spot for, for you. 
Um, but as said, I think the big data parts, uh, workloads, um, they could even be um, used now uh, with uh, normal Docker, or what, what we currently have without the HPC JS around it. And um, yeah, the only problem, or the, the problem arises when you have this distributed workloads um, in multiple containers. And yeah, I wanted to talk about system containers, so this is the slide that uh, Olga also showed. And this is where how I started uh, with Docker, and I think most of you guys also may, may have started with Docker, where you put a complete um, system inside of the container. So you have a lightweight init daemon, and then you have um, you use it as a virtual machine. And I could also put an SSH daemon here, and it looks like a virtual machine to, to everyone. But um, I think this is not where we where we are going. Hopefully, uh, ideally, it should be that you have one container with only one process running. So for instance, you could have one base image, and this is similar to what uh, Kubernetes already does. So this base image just provides a network namespace and uh, a volume um, entity. And then you put different stacks or different parts of your, of your operating system, basically, in different containers on top. So as this log is simple in a container and the monitoring stack is in the container, they all share the same network namespace, so they can communicate over local host. And then your service, maybe Postgres or whatever, is also uh, only one additional layer, and they could all have different um, user lands, for instance. So this could be Ubuntu, this could be Alpine, and this could be uh, Red Hat. And then you could have a container that's only doing backups, or that's only doing uh, housekeeping jobs, which only starts every five minutes, and then goes away, and then starts again, and goes away, so that you have all your different um, pieces uh, yeah, put in different containers, and hence has a very, very nicely shaped and what we didn't talk about is user land optimization. I think all this, uh, most of the, um, well not all, but most of the benchmarks you see about, about Docker containers, they use the same operating system on the host as they do on the, on the, uh, virtual, uh, on the, on the container. And what seems to be a good comparison, I think it's not really a good comparison because you can easily tweak and optimize the user land of the container and get better and, uh, and better performance. And I have this, here, so I put, and this is back from uh, November 2015 or 14 even, I think 14, uh, where I gave a talk in China about MPI benchmarks in uh, containers, and this also um, touches what uh, I think you about the RDMA uh, said. I mean, RDMA, as you bypass the kernel, um, you don't need much within the container to use RDMA. The, the kernel module has to be loaded and then you can just pass the InfiniBand interface, for instance, inside of the container and then you can, you can use InfiniBand and it has no, actually not, not really a penalty on, on the InfiniBand device because you bypass the kernel anyway. It's just the process talking to the underlying hardware. And what we see here is that the native node is the blue, uh, the blue line and uh, the lower so this, uh, the benchmark uh, is uh, latency, so the lower the better. And we see that the blue line is slightly higher than this yellow line, and this yellow line is center 6. So to be fair, the center 7 installation on the native node was uh, an alpha version of center 7. But what this shows is that if you tweak the user land within the container, you can create more or, or get more performance out of it um, than the native installation has. So you don't need to potentially don't need to uh, agree on a common installation on your cluster because every application can carry its own user land which is optimized for the application at hand. Um, what, what was the native operating system? CentOS 7 Alpha it was uh, November 2014, so it was. And then you started uh, CentOS 7 or CentOS 6 or Ubuntu 12 container in the Exactly, yeah. And they were all running at the same time. And I have a, a link here so you can watch a YouTube video or the paper, it's not really a paper, it's a, it's a structured, um, structured documentation because it's not peer reviewed and it's just uh, me having put together this uh, documentation, but still, yeah, and as I said, I think this shows uh, greatly that the user land could be optimized and um, this is we are not talking about already and we should talk about it because you could have a very lightweight busy box container or Alpine Linux or whatnot and then optimize your workload. Um. Sorry. Just a question regarding the MPI stuff that you were also using there. So uh, how would you compare the MPI stuff inside the container and outside of it? 
Were you using the same one? Uh, yeah, I was compiling it. I was compiling it was in the, the container. So when I created the container, the, the image had a compiled version of OpenMPI. I forgot the way which version it was. But and what about outside across the container? Uh, I also compiled it with the same um, so flag. So that's why it was working and, and it actually it was accelerating, further accelerating, because you were using exactly the same MPI stack outside and inside. So that's sure. uh, when you talk open it, when you talk HPC, that's a problem because it's mostly not the case, you know, because uh, MPI stacks, most of them are proprietary, so... But what, what, what provides you or prevents you from um, doing the same thing, the having... Licensing. Yeah, but... You don't give this open MPI, the, the, the MPI stack to your users, for example, a Cray or an MPI stack to your users, for them to build the images, okay, because they are licensed stacks, so it's, it's, a, it's a licensed product. So that is, a, is, a, is an issue in, in, in HPC environment. Yeah, maybe, yeah. I think the, sure, if you, if you create a, build, a base image with MPI in it, then you have to provide the MPI that you want to run at the end, yeah. right? But I haven't tried it out, but I could imagine that you can have this approach of multiple layers of containers and having one container that provides you with the MPI and all the libraries, and then you just mount this or, or reuse the volumes of this whole container and then, and then create multiple MPI containers that just sit alongside the, the, your real container or your real application. And so you do not have to install everything in this one container. You could have multiple containers that serve the purpose of providing resources to uh, your application container. And then you can develop with OpenMPI, which is open. And then when you use it, move it to the um, to the production system. You uh, might use Intel MPI or Cray MPI or what it's not that simple, actually. Yeah, I think that's sure. Yeah. <laughs> If I can ask a little more along this line, because this kind of job is very typical for the HPC workload, right? The, now you see there are two tasks running on two nodes. Uh, I'm also wondering maybe I'm even simpler than him. When you start the, the container, the container will be able, able to grab two nodes, starting MPI typically starting on one thread, right? And then spread out to everything. And here you grab one node, and then how, does, how do they talk? And, propagate and get all of the threads started. So I, I can show this. I, I promise you some yeah, if, uh, um, if you show I have, it, interesting. But I think I have to mirror first. Tip, tip, tip. OK, so we should see something. I will make a new bigger one. So this is my laptop, obviously. And I have this Slurm D container. Which, yeah, which inherits from my Slurm container, which I just installed Slurm, and then put some configurations uh, on top of it. And I have this uh, compose file that I talked about. So this is just um, a description of how to start multiple containers. Mm -hmm. So instead of doing Docker run and then providing the ports and providing the environment and providing DNS with uh, with flags to this Docker run command, you can just use this Docker compose file, which is the same or has the same information as you would uh, put to the docker command docker run command so i have a console uh, node i have slurm control daemon and i have slurm daemon and if i do docker compose up minus d then i will start this images or this this images and create containers and if i and if i log into the slurm daemon here I have this one container, then I have as info, and I see that I have just this one node, right? So this is the node where I'm, where I'm on. So you've got one node. Yeah, wait, I will start more. You want more, I start more. So I scale the Slurm daemon to, let's say, five. So you get five nodes. And now I get four, five containers with all with their own uh, IP stack, so it's basically like virtual machines. And if I exec to the same node again, then I have more. So now I have five nodes. And what I do here, I have a little init system, which is um, supervisor daemon. And I even run SSH somewhere. Should do. No. 
Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, anyway, but I could run like minus n five. I could run the whole stack here. So I have the little Slurm cluster. I didn't start an SSH demon, so I cannot SSH it to a different host. But this right, is, right. so now but we this have is, five virtual machine all available yeah, for you. Yeah. This is what I did with this MPI benchmark. I had right. um, mm -hmm. multiple sets of containers, and they were running also an SSHD, so I was right. I were, were able to um, SSH into it. So yeah, mm -hmm. this is um, the Slurm cluster, and right. I can scale it even. I, I, I think I shouldn't scale it too much, but uh, I can I can even scale it down again. And all the setup um, uses console in, uh, in the back. So when a new start, when a new host is started with a service slurmd, then the slurm daemon configuration will be rewritten, and the service or the daemons will be restarted, and then you have a, a bigger cluster. Right, right. So now you're getting ready to run that MPI. Uh, I can scale it down to zero, and then. Uh, but I also have this SSH set up here, so I, I will get ahead of myself and I'm starting the slum and the singularity uh, apps. Now I have to just get the IP address. So this command provides you provides us with the IP address of this host here. And if I and here I can SSH into the other host. So we see, I do SSH because I run an SSH daemon here. So SSH is not forbidden. So I mean, the gods will they will punish you because you shouldn't run SSH. But it's not you can do it. It's like I mean that's. What Holger also says, I mean, the Docker containers are just groups of processes, not not fancy, not nothing more, and they are like isolated by name spaces. So, but they are just processes, and if you if you are able to run a process, if you run an application as a process, then there is no um, no no real problem for Docker to use it as well because they are just groups of processes. I mean, it's the environment around that you need, like SSH daemon and Slurm and MPI and so on. Uh, which which um, prevents you from doing much more, but yeah. and basically, basically they are just groups of processes. So and that's what Jerome also said last year when we had this workshop. He was here and he said, if you can run it as a process, then you can run it as a container. And it's, it's no, right, no big right, right, right. And that's, I think that's true. Yeah, I messed up my own schedule. It's like four. <laughs> I wanted to to start um, second presentation, but I think we. Have to do the break.